As Pastor Hardwick used to say, if, if that don't light your fire, your wood is wet. <laughs> if you're not already standing, would you please rise to your feet for the reading of God's word for this morning, which is coming to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Christ died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, a new creation, and the old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we just pray right now that you would speak, O oh Lord, Breathe, Holy Spirit, anew through your ancient words, ever true, meant to change us, transform us, renew our minds, Lord God, so that we may know you and your perfect will, Lord God. May our hearts receive what you would speak today. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be pleasing unto you, Lord. And may your word take root within us and bear fruit through us for the goodness of who you are. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, Lord God. That is our prayer this day and every day. We thank you. We praise you, O Lord. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? Mm. Do you feel like you've been to church this morning? Amen. <laughs> Do you feel like you are the church this morning? Yes. Good. Good. You know, we can't base our faith always on our feelings. And if you've lived in this walk long enough, you know that what I'm saying is true. But that doesn't mean our feelings are evil either. That doesn't mean God denies us our feelings. He wants us to experience him and celebrate him in those feelings. And what a gift, what a blessing it is when we can gather as part of, of the body, the universal body of Christ throughout the ages and be able to do that. And I thank God with you today for the blessing it is to gather and be able to do that. Thank you for coming and for not forsaking the gathering of the saints. Today, you know, we can sit at home and do it all online if you want to, but there's something you're going to miss when you do that. Amen. Something happens in the presence of God and in the presence of one another, and that can't change. It won't change. And so as we dive in today, as I hope you will recall, over the past two weeks, we've been walking together through a sermon series we've entitled Knowing the Way. And I hope you'll also remember that two weeks ago in part one, we began to just merely scratch the surface of what it means to answer the ultimate question. You remember how Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And so today he asks us the same question, who do you say I am? Who do we say that God is according to how God has revealed himself to us in and through the scriptures? Now, as I said, and I'll say it again, no one sermon can exhaust that. I mean, that would be <laughs> ridiculous. We know that. But hopefully, as we began our study of Psalm 95, that gave us enough truth concerning who God is, that it, it propelled us into week two, where we started to ask the question, okay, based on that first question, who is God, now we can start to address 
Who does God say we are? So as we could have selected any number of passages from the Bible, we chose 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 11 through 21, and we unpacked the first half of that last week. And so today we're going to pick up with verse 15 and continue diving in to see who does God say we are. And today we're going to add a little bit to that question. Who does God say we are based on what God has done? If you were paying attention to our gospel reading just a few minutes ago, you couldn't help but notice the Apostle Paul's emphasis on reconciliation. God is certainly for it, and that means so too should we, even as messy and as complicated and sometimes seemingly long, long delayed as it may be. I think it'd be helpful for us just a moment to remind ourselves of what we learned last week the Cambridge Dictionary of Christianity, just one source we could consult. What is the definition of reconciliation? It is the process of restoring right relationships when harm or injury has come between two or more people. The process of restoring right relationship when there has been division, when there has been separation. Restoring right relationships. Well, you hear me say this often, and, and you know this is true. It, it may only take one to forgive, but it takes at least two to reconcile, Amen. right? Everybody's nodding their heads. You know what I'm talking about. Just this past week, since last Sunday, there have been more than a few of you who have reached out to me to share just how deeply and personally you know that statement to be true. Even this morning, some of you have, have stopped me and said, Ben, your, your sermon last week, I, I want to talk to you about that because I got a testimony. I got something to share. It's a beautiful thing, and it proves exactly what the scriptures teach us about how universal this is. It's part of the human condition. And it seems like, I know, sometimes, no matter how hard we try or for how long we seem to endure, reconciliation, this, this restoration of right relationship Man, sometimes it just does not seem to come, not in our human relationships. And, and why is that? Well, I, I think part of it is, you know, sometimes you talk about our own little window to the world. I don't think it's really like that. I think if we're absolutely honest, most of us have like a little peephole to the world. <laughs> we think we see everything so clearly, and yet we don't. There might be just that little tiny pinpoint that we can see for what it really is. And then everything, you know, remember the last time you were looking through a people, maybe it was in a, in a hotel or maybe it was in your apartment door and you're looking through there and you can see that little bit clearly and in focus. The things around the edges are kind of blurred and warped and then there's a whole lot you just plain can't see at all. The longer I live, the more I think the human experience is a lot like But with God, our creator, Lord of heaven and earth, all this language we use to try to lift him up, and rightfully so, with him, it is not that way. It is so very different. God sees what we cannot, and he knows what we do not. How comforting then to also know that the heart of God is very much so a heart for reconciliation. Amen. When we sing in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. That is a statement affirming reconciliation all the way. Don't miss that next time you sing that. Even when we can't see how things will one day be made right, all things will be made whole. When we can't see that, and when you're tempted to doubt that that is the way it is, remember, God sees what we do not. God knows what we do not. And we don't have faith in ourselves. We don't have faith in our own discernment. We don't have faith in our own understanding. We have faith in him. So last time we remembered the parable of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15, and, and, and maybe, based on how we looked at it last week, and as we're talking more this morning, maybe what we should call it is the parable of the reconciling father. 
As I said, so much of the time we focus on that younger son for all kinds of good and, and, and right reasons. But maybe our emphasis should be more upon the father himself. Do you remember how that parable ends? In his gentle words of correction to his eldest son, you remember, he, the eldest son is, is angry. He's offended at this lavish display of grace shown to his wasteful baby brother. That's what the word prodigal means, by the way. He's the one who has wasted what he has been given. And so the elder brother, as the father comes to him, he says to him, you have, this is my paraphrase, he says, you have forgotten who your brother is to us because you have forgotten who you are to me. You know, that is the single worst thing I believe that sin does to human beings. You know, the Bible talks about sins with an S, and that's usually how in our culture we like to talk about it, the bad things we do. We make a list, whatever you think sins are, and then there's another group of Christians over here that doesn't agree with that. They've got a different list of sins, and everybody's got their own list of sins. What do you do? Don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang out with girls who do. Whatever it is, you've got a list. <laughs> no offense to the women here that smoke and drink and chew. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Just let that go. But that's how we usually think of, of sin. And the truth is, scripturally, and even traditionally in the church throughout history, sin is seen as a much, much, much bigger, broader issue than that. It's not simply about the bad things we do. It's much more pervasive. It's much larger. It, 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 it's something that makes us forget who we truly are, if we ever knew. It makes us forget who one another is, if we ever knew. Sin is... All of these things, it's how it does so much damage to us and through us, bringing pain and suffering and brokenness into our relationship with God, with one another, even with the wholeness of creation. This is how pervasive sin is. I have a picture I'd like to share, if we can see that image on the screen. You know what that is, right? Yeah. Have you ever heard of the web of life. Some of us are old enough to remember when we were going through science class, we talked about food chains, right? And you'd start with like grass and you'd work your way up. And when I was a kid, it was always fun to find out, okay, where does humankind stop? And then it was always lots of fun to add something on top. Is a, a bear or a shark something that can, <laughs> can eat us, right? Well, nobody talks about food chains anymore. Biologists today talk about food webs. We talk about the web of life. And what is that other than a way to try and describe the interrelatedness, the, the connections between all living things in any ecosystem? And then how all those different ecosystems come together, that's what forms our very planet. Careful observation and study of the natural world makes very clear that this is how the Lord, the one who is the giver of life, as the old creeds call him, this is how he has designed life to be. Can we see that a second again? Sorry. Intricately interwoven, interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent, each strand affecting all the others, strong and resilient like a spider's web. The spider's web is one of the most tenacious substances known to man, especially given how fine and how delicate it is. It is incredibly strong, but incredibly delicate all at the same time with each strand of that web dependent upon the other to support the whole. That's how life works. It's beautiful, isn't it? And it's not just how life works. This is how our relationships work work. This is how our social life works, our relational life as human beings. This is how it works. But again, like both the sons in the parable of the prodigal, if we forget, that is, if we ever knew this, if we forget who we were made to be in right relationship with God, if God is at the center of that and all of us are parts of that web and all of our relationships connected to God and connected to one another, if we don't know this, if we forget this, 
everything starts to come apart. And that's precisely what sin does, what sin as a condition is. I'm good with that for a minute, guys. Thank you. Sin in this way, it's not just about bad things we do. It's not your laundry list of, of, of things to avoid. Sin in this way is like a virus. It's like a contagion that spreads to us and through us. We see its effects all around us all the time, and I dare say even within us. And let me explain. Sin, this way, if we understand it, we can see how it, it creates a culture which no longer sees women as, as born to be daughters of their heavenly father, but as objects to be used, to be possessed, to be consumed with the lust of the eyes and then discarded whenever their fleetingly desirable appearance seems to change. Sin warps the people to no longer see men as born to be sons of their heavenly father, but instead we see men as animals, as enemies, as threats, as brutish predators to be distrusted and feared. This is what sin does to us. Sin will degrade a people to no longer see children as especially beloved by their heavenly father, to no longer see children as precious gifts that God gives to his people and to his creation, to be loved and nurtured in his way. Instead, sin blinds people to the abuse of children, to their neglect and their exploitation. Sin will allow children to be recast in our lives as, as burdens rather than blessings, as inconveniences, as limitations upon our freedom. Sin makes the children of society bearers of baggage that they are in no way equipped to carry. And the consequences have generational repercussions. Some of you know all too well what I'm talking about. You have carried burdens since you were a child that you were in no way able to shoulder. And you still do. That's the pervasiveness of sin. That's what sin does. And that sin, if I can see that web one more time, thank you. The condition of sin is like the rain. You see the dew, the rain that is upon this spider's web. And as strong as that web is, as enduring and everlasting as that web is, the web of life, all of our interwoven relationships, it can withstand only so much. But if there is no relief from the downpour, if you've ever seen a spider web in a torrential rain, if the weight of sin becomes overwhelming, that web cannot hold. And brokenness, despair, even death is the result and welcome to earth. This is the human condition. And the greatest threat we face today are there are people just like you and just like me who walk around and say, that's not the way it is. There is no such thing as sin. You just make choices. Some of your choices might not work out the best for you, but that's okay. You made a bad choice or two. Other people say, well, you know, your sin or their sin without ever stopping to say, what about my sin? All kinds of that language and rhetoric in our world today. Do you see where that leads? If that is how I perceive sin, not only will I fail to understand it biblically, but I will also fail to realize how desperately I need a savior from it. Amen. Hear me when I say that. This is why John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, if we see it for what it is and we call it for what it is and we admit to it in our own hearts, our own lives, if we confess our sin, God who is faithful, God who is just, will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all what? Unrighteousness. The very condition of broken relationship, wrong relatedness, wrong relationship, that's what unrighteousness is, the opposite of righteousness. Jesus is not our life coach. He is not your friendly neighborhood motivational speaker. He is not merely your business advisor or your personal cheerleader. None of these roles could ever be sufficient. They could not even be close to being enough. What we need and what he is, is a savior. 
We must be saved from sin. That has never changed. And regardless of how we want to repackage it, regardless of how we may like to think we have evolved and come so far socially as human beings, you take away our toys and our affluence and see what happens. We must be saved from sin, saved from what our lives and all the relationships become when they are broken, when sin defines who we are. We just got done singing all morning about who we really are, who he says we are. And yet I've been doing this long enough to know that there are plenty of people in this room that your sin in your own heart, whether you know it or not, is what defines you right now. How much more so then in this world in need of reconciliation? Is that the case? I'm done with the web. Thank you guys very much. So this is what Paul is getting at when he gets into verse 15, back to 2 Corinthians 5. Turn there with me if you're not there already. When Paul says that Christ died and was raised for everyone, why? So that we may no longer live for ourselves. And that is the result of sin. It only serves to perpetuate sin. But instead, Christ died and was raised for us so that we might live for him. You've heard it said, we are saved from sin. But add this to it. We are saved for life in Christ. It's not enough to just talk about what we're saved from. We have to talk about what are we saved for. And that's what Paul is trying to unpack here and teach us. So what does that mean, really? I mean, how might we live for Christ? Let's let Paul answer that for himself, shall we? Let's read on in verse 16. So if we are living for Christ, Paul says, we will be enabled, empowered, to stop evaluating others, including Christ himself, from a human point of view. Do you see that? Other translations say from a worldly point of view, or, or some of the older translations say according to the flesh, which is another way of talking about our, our, our limited human perspective. Talking about the spirit means we're starting to talk about what does it mean to, to move in the, in the way of God. The flesh in this sense isn't necessarily something that has negative connotation in as much as it means the limitedness of our humanness. So what Paul is saying here is this. He says, you and I, we don't have to see and know anyone, including Jesus Christ, solely through that blurry, distorted peephole of a lens anymore that, that just leads us to wrong relatedness, wrong relationship. Verse 16 into 17 here, he says, how differently we know him now. We need new eyes. We need new hearts. We need new lives. And look at this. God is the one alone who will give that to us. Because anyone who truly belongs to Christ, who is in Christ, has become a new Creation, a new person. The old life is gone. Behold, the new has come. Now I ask you, can you say amen, so be it, to that today? Is that your testimony? Is that your experience? Is that your story? Can you say, Father, I used to see you like the younger prodigal in the parable, that son. I used to see you as limiting and constrictive, someone I was better off without. But now, now I see you clearly. I was blind, but now I see. Now I know you differently. Now I know that I was dead in sin, but you have given me your life. You are my life. If you are a new creation in Christ, what I just said makes sense to you. If you're not a new creation in Christ, right now you don't know what I'm talking about. And I don't say that to try to be exclusive or to be harsh, but we have to. I'm telling you, folks, we are in a, a, a time in the history of the world where what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ has to be so clearly defined, not, not to the world, to our own hearts. It has to happen in the church first. And this isn't about just 
buckle down and try harder. This isn't about, well, you got to read more Bible. you got to pray longer, harder. No, it's not about that. Let's, let's see what happens here. Let's see how much this depends on God. Let's see how much this is the gift of God. And so listen to this. If you can't say that yet, if you can't say, Christ, you are my life, listen to the psalmist. David said it this way, Psalm 18, verse 19. He said, you brought me out into a broad and open place, a place of true freedom in you. That's what that means. Why? Because you delighted in me. The way we say it in 2019, in my father's house, there's a place for me. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. But if that's too much Christianese still (laughs) for you, Listen to me when I say this. One of the ways you can know that you can know that you know that God is working within you, that God is making you new, that God is making you a new creation, one of the ways you can know is that you no longer desire to live for yourself. That's what Paul tells us. Self-fulfillment will no longer be your goal. It can't be. It can't be. Because your greatest longing as a new creation, is not for self-fulfillment. It is for God-fulfillment. And not only for yourself, but for all of us together. In fact, you'll understand more and more and more that we can't be fulfilled in God unless we are fulfilled in God together. That's what being a part of the body of Christ means. To find your fulfillment, your wholeness, in right relationship with Christ and with one another. With Christ and with one another. You see that? with Christ and with one another. Are there growing pains in that? Yes. A thousand times, yes. That's the journey. That's the way of discipleship. And we'll talk more about that in weeks to come. I'm not saying this is over and done with immediately. It's, it's tough. We're a family. And families rub each other the wrong way. <laughs> families have to work things out. This idea of reconciliation, it's a journey. It's a process. It can be just flat out work sometimes. But we don't do this alone. We do it with God. We do it with one another, empowered by his spirit. And so Paul goes on, verse 18. Here he says, and all of this, all of this, everything we just talked about, in case you're wondering, Ben, how do I do this? How do I make this happen? You can't. This is a gift from God. This is God's doing, Paul says, who brought us back to himself, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And what's more, God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. Is this, is this starting to come clear? If you didn't know this before, I hope it's becoming crystal clear to you now who we are, why we are here, what our lives are for. But people don't have a purpose. Sin overwhelms us. It destroys us. But when we know who we are, we know whose we are, we know what we're for, what we're about, all of that can change. So what does Paul say? He says, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. So who are we? Christ's ambassadors. And what is an ambassador? You think about the ambassador to China or the ambassador to Japan. Someone sent out as a representative of a greater authority. Who are we to represent? Who is our authority? Christ. And what are ambassadors to do? They just go to fancy dinners? They just run that place that if you're ever in trouble in a foreign country, you can run to it? Now they do a lot more than that. Ambassadors work. They work to create and build right relationships with others. If we are a new creation in Christ, my friends, that is who we are. So Paul continues, verse 20. He says, we are ambassadors of Christ because... How and why? Because God is making his appeal to the world through us. We speak for Christ when we say, come back to God. Literally, be reconciled to God. And then one of the single most beautiful verses, I think, in all of Scripture. And this is where, you know, when you read different Bible translations, I think the New Living Translation, which I preach out of that a lot because it's more conversational, contemporary English. But this is one place where I think it it misses it. 
and we can talk about atonement, and we can talk about a propitiation. We can use all those, those old English words to talk about what, what God does in and through the cross. And that's another conversation for another time. But for the sake of our purposes here today, when we say that God made Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, so that we, in him, might become the righteousness, not the unrighteousness, the righteousness of God. So much, so much in that one verse. And so whether you've heard it a million times or this is the very first time that you've heard the good news, listen to this. The only one, the only one who's ever walked this earth that needed no reconciliation, this one, this Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, Son of Man, all these titles we use for him, it was he who took our sin, that condition, that brokenness of the world upon and within his own body. This is the great mystery, this, this, this virus, this infection of sin. Once Christ softens our hearts and opens our eyes, we feel and we see it so clearly in our broken relationships and all that remains unreconciled in our hearts, in our homes, in the church, in our communities, in the world. This is what makes sin so devastating, so deadly. This is what we know makes sin such an affront to the righteousness, to the holiness, the wholeness of God. Can we see that spider web one more time, gentlemen? Like too much rain on the web. Sin eventually weighs us down. All that imagery throughout the Old Testament and the New of being laden and oppressed. I mean, the language is literally when you are weighed down by the burden upon you. This is what sin does, like a stone upon our backs. It distorts and it breaks us and it breaks our right relationships. It destroys what the scriptures call righteousness. But that broken, that fallen way of humanity, that condition of sin as we may call it, it is that which Jesus takes upon and within himself that he willingly bears, chooses to bear on our behalf upon the cross. And listen, this is what Paul is saying. Get this. He says he becomes sin crucified. Stop and think about that. Try as impossible as it seems to even begin to get your mind around what that means. To see Jesus upon the cross is to see very clearly a picture, a, a representative, even, even, even maybe a sacrament, a sign, to see what sin is and what sin does. Don't ever look at the cross and not consider how he became sin for us. So that no matter what you have experienced in your life, the brokenness, the pain, the separation, all of that unreconciliation that weighs us down, we are living in a world, a culture especially, that is increasingly consumed with and delirious with despair. And all of that Not only did he take within his own body, for our sake, he became it for us. That's who God is. And so in this mystery that only God understands, he became sin for us. He bore it upon the cross, but you know that's not the end of the story, and thank God that it's not. Paul makes clear, not only did he die, but he was raised. And so as Christians, our faith is built on the cross and the resurrection. You cannot have one without the other, and it's the basis of who we are, how we're supposed to understand our role in this world, how we should see the reality of history as it, as it is playing out. By his spirit, by his resurrection life within us as believers, we can say that he overcame death by death, and so too can he overcome that within our own hearts, within our own relationships, within our own lives. That's who he is. That's what he has done. 
by that same spirit, that resurrection life within us, we can learn to walk in his way, his righteousness. God in Christ has made that way possible and God in Christ is the way. And so, who does God say we are? What did Paul say? We are ministers of reconciliation. Christ came with the ministry of reconciliation and he has passed that along to his church. He hasn't left us alone. He works his purposes in us and through us to reconcile his loved ones to himself. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. And what that really means is that we are people who know who know what it is, what it was to be dead in sin, but to, as every time we baptize, but as having been raised to walk in newness of his life. Church, we are people who know the pain of brokenness. We know the deep wounds of broken and unreconciled relationships, but praise God, we know also that God is making us whole by his spirit. And sometimes I know that it feels like the road is long. I know it feels incredibly difficult. And some of you right now today, you're the same people who in our worship, in, and, and I'm not trying to call anybody out or pick on anybody, but in our worship, when Lisi was taking us there, if anybody knows, and you sat there and you said, I, I don't. I want to, but I don't. So what that means is that you're somebody that right now, the weight, that burden is still so heavy And if I saw you today, how much more does your heavenly Father see you? This is where faith, faith is trust, is so important. This is where the body, the body that we lean upon, the body that supports us, is so important. This is why we need each other. So that when one is weak, in that web when one of those strands is broken, it doesn't fall, it doesn't come apart because the rest of the strands keep the whole together. And today, that broken strand might be you. Next week, it could be me. This is who we are. This is what it means to be ministers of reconciliation. This is what it means to be ambassadors for Christ. You are not in this alone. You are not meant to do this alone. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the what? The children of God, those who work for peace, those who seek to bring, not to say everything's okay when it's not okay. That's not what making peace means, not in the Bible. Working for peace, according to Jesus, doesn't mean we just put a Band-Aid on it and ignore you. It means that we come alongside each other. And we rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. And we bear the burdens that will come in this life together. That is who we are. One of our values is Christ Church Nashville. You'll see it if you go out in the lobby and see that cool looking. What do you call that? It's not a billboard. What do you call it? A, I don't even know. You know what I mean? That <laughs> it has all these great pictures of different folks from around the church. And one of our values there, it's printed right on there. We are people seeking unity and reconciliation. Let that begin here, among the family of faith that God is making us, and let that extend out and radiate out through us into wherever God is going to place you this very day. So what does that look like in practice? The place we begin, one of the things I'm excited, if you haven't got your tickets to come see Jim Cimbala and and the Brooklyn Tabernacle Singers come, Jim Cimbala changed my life when I read his book years and years ago, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, about where we start with prayer. 
and the time in prayer is so important. And so today, the altars are, are always open, and, and, and after you would, uh, the service concludes, if you, you need prayer, please come. I'd be happy to pray with you. There's usually some of our altar care team that'd be happy to pray, but I want us to pray together in a little different way as we close the service today. And St. Francis of Assisi had a prayer that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. And it's a place corporately that we can pray together to begin to answer the question, what does it look like? What does it look like for us to be ministers of reconciliation? What does it look like for us to be ambassadors for Christ? When we repent, when we give our burden over to the Lord, the sin that we carry, not just our own, but the consequences of everyone else's, right? This, this condition that, that will crush us if we are not saved. As we hand that over to the Lord at the foot of the cross, and he creates in us this new creation, this new life, what we call being born again. I know a lot of that's Christianese that's hard to explain to folks sometimes today. But what I can tell you is you can know it and you can have it. We can have him. And even in the midst of if our problems don't go away, if everything isn't healed or reconciled immediately, that's not what we're promised. What we're promised is that we have him in the midst of it. And we have each other in the midst of that as his church. So as we close, the prayer is going to be displayed on the screen. Would you rise to your feet? I want us to pray this together. Would you join with me? And as you hear these words, as you say these words with your brothers and sisters in the Lord, listen. Not just to our voices, but listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you where and how he is going to work this in your life this week starting today. Pray with me. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. This week, your assignment is this. Ask the Lord to show you how that comes to fruition. That prayer bears fruit in you and through you this week. If we are serious about this, to be ministers of reconciliation, to be ambassadors for Christ, that's our mission. And no matter where you are, if it's on your street, if it's in your place of business, if it's in the line at Kroger, if you're the last one in line at the convenience store, if it's at the pool with the kids on Tuesday, whatever that may be. It might be as you're leaving this place here this morning. Say, Lord, show me. Let me see. Let me hear. Let me be. And I cannot wait to hear the testimonies, to hear the praise that will be given, the glory that will be given to God for how he will move in that way. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We magnify you, Lord God, and we seek our lives to be that which would give you glory and honor through all that we would think, say, and do. Lord God, forgive our sin. And as we came to the table, and Pastor Greg led us through that pair of, uh, prayer of contrition, Lord, what is contrition? It is, as you have said in the Psalms, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Contrite to be, to be broken, to be brought low. And Lord, we thank you that even though sin would weigh us down, it would, it would break us into dust. You are the one who still brings dust together and 
breath breathes your Ruach Elohim, the breath of life into dust and brings life where only death had been. Praise God for who you are. And we pray now, Lord God, let your breath inspire us anew. Breathe into us, Holy Spirit, to be ministers of reconciliation, to be your vessels, your instruments of peace, your peace, wherever you have called us, wherever you will lead us now, today, and in this week ahead. Lord God, we are your church gathered so we may be your church sent. Go before us to be your sons and your daughters, your children, more and more being transformed to be in the image of Christ for your glory. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask you this in the mighty and holy name of the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come, the one who became sin for us so that in him we might become your righteousness, O oh God. In his name, in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed week.